Greetings, Stamp Sleuths. Today we're investigating rocks on stamps and rocks on my table. This is going to be a, a new direction I'm taking in some of my videos. I'll be doing stamps continually, of course. That's my main interest. However, I'm also going to do anything that sort of correlates with them or is a uh, spin-off. In this case, I have a small topical here of stamps that show rocks. And what I want to do is discuss the associated rocks in my collection. Uh, the first thing you need to know is that many countries do depict their uh, uh, native rocks on their stamps. Here is one from the um, United States and it's a block of four and it's showing azurite, copper, varicite and wolfenite. Now I will only be talking about one of these which is the copper later on. Botswana is showing agate and it's showing pink banded agate as well. Uh, Canada, the stamp from Canada here, is showing native copper. And then New Zealand has nephrite, uh, agate, and amethyst. Namibia is showing a quartz crystal. And here Botswana is also showing an amethyst crystal. And then Czechoslovakia is uh, showing a um, banded agate. So I'm just going to go through these one at a time. The first thing you need to know is that there are basically three groups of rocks, and these are showing some of them. There's igneous rocks. They're formed uh, uh, literally from fire in the earth. The word ignis is uh, Latin, means fire, and they're formed uh, from congealing magma, at both under and above uh, surface. Sedimentary rocks, which um, I'm not going to really be discussing, but you need to know about them anyways. They're from the word Latin, seder, mean, that means to settle, or sedre means to settle. And they form from accumulations of sediments that solidify into uh, visual layers. And then there's metamorphic, uh, from the Greek meta, which means change. And they're rocks that are altered due to depth and heat or pressure. Now, the first one I want to talk about is quartz. So what I'm going to do is remove um, the, some of these stamps, just for now. And um, I want to focus on this little guy right there from the Namib Namibia, it, showing the quartz crystals. Now, quartz is a silicate, and it's resistant to acid, and it's an important industrial uh, material. You've heard about quartz watches. Uh, it's used in other, other industrial uh, applications as well as uh, sand is made up of uh, minute uh, bits of quartz itself, and uh, that's part of the glass industry. It's the most varied of all minerals, and it occurs in almost every single mineral environment, igneous, sedimentary, or metamorphic. So that's, uh, it's quite a varied uh, mineral. Um, Quartz crystals often form as druzy. Now, the first thing I want to show you are quartz crystals. Okay, this is a quartz crystal here, and it's just a single, and you can see where it's been, uh, and it's like glass. Really nice. Uh, and this has got some quartz crystals that are actually interlaced. You can see them there. So that's, that's interesting. However, a lot of quartz crystals form as what I just said, druzy, on surfaces on linings in a void. And you can see on this rock that there's some matrix here, the original mother rock, and this is formed inside of perhaps a cavity. So um, we, we actually call this and these little crystals here rock crystal. We don't just say quartz, we say rock crystal. And the rock crystal, the word uh, quartz, comes from crystallos from the Greek, and it literally means ice crystal because the thought in the uh, early times was that this was super frozen ice frozen so deeply that it could not melt. So the Greeks believed this to be ice. Now, the first one I want to also look at here is the amethyst crystal. Now, this is not the best example, but it's the only one I have. And you can see that this is um, in, a, in a, a matrix, and there's some weird little crystals there as well. And it's kind of banded between different colors. And uh, this one comes in a variety of, of purples. And here's one, a stamp that shows it from New Zealand. I'll put that up a little bit better. And uh, it comes in a variety of colors of violet through to almost blue tones. And it can be very pale lavender as well to a deep purple and often has a secondary tone of blue. So if you see these uh, crystals with other colors in them, that's often a dye. 
So that's about those. Now, quartz also comes in the formation of agate. So here's an image of agate. Here's an image of agate in the stamp. And here's the Botswana agate. Oh, and I forgot to show that. That's a pretty stamp from the United States showing a amethyst. Um, now, and now here's the Botswana amethyst too before I carry on. Okay, now agate is a, a very stone, stone is very common formation, and it's usually a combination, common, combination of chalcedony and quartz, and it's primarily formed in volcanic or metamorphic rocks. Um, oftentimes it's deposited in very peculiar ways. No, uh, notably, in something called druzy, and I'm going to pull a rock here, and I'm going to show you, and you can see, I don't know if you're catching the sparkle on that, but there are tiny, minute little crystals all through this rock, uh, and that's called druzy. Now, in some cases, uh, this is, is more notable. It's, it's uh, more noticeable, the little uh, bits and pieces, and I'll go into that in a minute here. Oftentimes, this is inside. You can see the outside looks rather plain, and there's crystals here. Often this is inside the hollow of a stone, like this. So these are geodes. A geode is a round stone with a fairly plain looking back. I'm going to move these out of the way temporarily. Plain, plain you know, un, unremarkable looking back, but when you open them up and cut them, uh, they're, they're pretty remarkable inside. Now, this sheen is not what you get if you cut them naturally. That's what you get. So what's happened in this is that a lapidary uh, specialist, and that's what you call people that uh, work with uh, agates and stones, has polished this on their machine. Uh, this is here also, a dark one, and you can see there's crystals inside of it, and they're all, they're really pretty. And then here's one that's a bit bigger, and this is a natural uh, geode. It hasn't been uh, polished, but you can see that there's a lot of, almost a pale lavender inside of that. Now, they don't always deposit crystals. Sometimes they just deposit material, and this is a huge geode here. You can see the outside layer is very plain, but the inside is really quite cool. It's, it's very sculptural, and the back, you can see how boring it is. If you walk that laying, by that laying on the ground, you wouldn't even pay notice to it. Uh, this is all natural. This is uh, jasper, they call it, when it's this color. Uh, so you can also get these in round formations. This is called Oregon geode. So this would have been from a round stone and it's been cut and it becomes translucent. This one is called a thunder egg because it has kind of a star in it. And look at that side. So that's how it would have appeared when it was first cut. This is how it would have appeared after being polished. So the thunder eggs are nodule-like rocks, which I've discussed here, and they're formed within rhyolo rhyolic volcanic layers, which are very silica rich. And they usually have centers of chalcedony or agate or jasper or opal. And so this one is a jasper center. And this is chalcedony or uh, just silica itself. And they're quite um, coveted by collectors. You can see why they're pretty spectacular. Now the next one I want to talk about is what's called desert rose. Now this is a bit of a confusing, oh, before I go on, this is a, a river agate that's been tumbled. And this is an agate that started life out much like this, uh, but was cut and polished and turned into a necklace. So jewelry is one of the things that this, this uh, along with decorative bits and pieces, that this stone is, is used for. So now I'm going to talk about something called a desert rose. And this is another form of druzy. And I'm going to bring out a whole bunch of funny little examples here, and I'll discuss them and why I'm bringing them out. And... Uh, We'll go over that. So now you're seeing four or five different things here. Now this is a uh, real traditional desert rose. You can see it's, it looks like a little flower bud for want of a better word. And what it's made up of is tiny, tiny little uh, flat plane crystals that have been deposited. And that's what druzy is. And this, these often form um, rose-like or radially, in other words, in a circle. Now this is also desert druzy, but it's not uh, as well um, defined, and it's deposited uh, in a in a more random fashion, as has this. You can see that it's, it sort of has a rose-like uh, appearance, but it's a little more gem-like than this one. Um, and then here's one that's been taken and put into a necklace, and you can see that there are tiny rose-like deposits in that. 
And here is another that's been put into a necklace. And this is actually an interesting piece because this is a piece of bone inside. We figure it might be dinosaur bone and the druzy has uh, rosed up on top of its surface. And these come in very small or, and this is going to be a bit of a challenge, huge. This sam example here is at what they call a specimen or a cabinet example, and it's desert rose. What's really interesting about this piece is that here are this type of desert rose on it, and you can see these, these ones are a little more gem-like. However, when I move it around, I don't know if you can see that right here, you can see starting a few more tabular looking pieces. And then on this side, you can see down here, there's a lot more tabular formations. This thing is heavy uh, and it's interesting. We actually purchased this in Quartzsite, Arizona, which is the rock hounds and rock uh, lapidary capital probably of the world. Okay, now the next thing I wanna talk about is jade. And I didn't have a stamp, I don't think, that showed jade here. Uh, no, I don't. Okay, I don't think so. Oh, there we go. I knew I had one. I reposition myself here. Get rid of this stuff. So this here is nephrite, which is a form of jade. And what I want to do is discuss jade for a little bit. Uh, it appears in the New Zealand stamp for a reason, and I'll explain that in a second. It's a mineral used in fine jewelry and ornaments. It's typically green, but can be yellow, white, virtually all colors, but typically green. And it can go from very light green to very dark green. This is more or less black. There's two types of uh, jade, nephrite, which is what I've got here, or jadeite. Nephrite is a sil silica base, based, and jadeite is sodium and aluminum. Uh, nephrite jade from New Zealand is known as popano in Maori. It is considered a taonga, a treasure, and it's protected under the Treaty of Waitangi. And it's found only in the South Island of New Zealand, which is where my ancestors came from, which is why I've got this. Um, it's often called greenstone, and tools, weapons, and ornaments were made for it by the Maoris. So this is uh, British Columbia jade, and it's been cut off of a large... Uh, piece and uh, this is the natural rock and you can actually see the the marks of the uh, rock saw but this side shows what it would look like if it was polished this piece here being from New Zealand is a tool and it's one of my uh, treasures from ancestors and it, it's really hard to see that it's green but it, it is a really deep green and it's green stone and it was used for had several uses it was for pounding you could pound things you could really poke them in uh, they were wood carvers and this specifically from what I understand was used mainly in carving wood for burnishing and it's like you can see it's as big as my hand from fingertips to wrist and it's it, it fits the palm beautifully so rocks and minerals not only appear on stamps, but they appear in our possessions. The next thing I want to discuss that I couldn't find a stamp on, but I wanted to talk about it because I think it's a really interesting stone, is turquoise. Now I've got some examples here. Uh, turquoise is an op opaque blue to green mineral that is a, hy a hydrated phosphate of copper and aluminum. Hydrate means water moved. Uh, it's often treated and stabilized with epoxy and it's reconstituted. Now, this is raw turquoise here, and you can see it's pretty powdery and not very interesting. This has been stabilized, and you can see it has a glassy surface. This has been stabilized, and that's been stabilized. They, they um, impregnate it with epoxies. These are reconstituted. In other words, uh, turquoise dust or just dye and resins are combined uh, and um, they make this. So you gotta be really careful when you buy turquoise. It can be um, faked pretty easily. Next stone I wanna discuss is obsidian. And uh, I only have two examples here. Obsidian is natural volcanic glass. These we found in Quartzsite, Arizona, out in the desert. Uh, and they had been left there through erosion and water and whatnot. There were bits of them lying everywhere. It's an igneous rock, which means it's underground often. And uh, it's usually black, sometimes green or brown. And this is used in jewelry, 
Uh, it's used to make weapons and blades uh, by the early peoples, but it's also used to do artwork. And this is from Mexico. And this is a piece, and you can see here the raw stone on the bottom where it's been cut. And it's one complete piece, and it's very glassy. And uh, you can still buy these in Mexico. Uh, and it, this actually has come from that, a bigger piece, of course. So that's obsidian. Galena is the next thing I want to discuss. And um, I don't think this was on any of my stamps. No, I don't think so. No. But I have had stamps come through my hands, which is why I brought it out. Galena is a natural form of lead sulfite. It's found typically in hydrothermal veins worldwide, and it can contain up to 0.05% of silver. So this is an associated mineral with silver and copper. And you can see that it uh, does have a very silvery uh, luster to it. The next one I want to talk about is copper. And that is shown here on this stamp here from the States. And I'll move these up so they're better in view. Now copper is an igneous sedimentary and metamorphic uh, mineral. In other words, it occurs both underground, above ground, and can be transformed through pressure. Uh, it's a solid chemical compound with a well-defined structure that occurs, na occurs naturally in pure form, and it's an excellent conductor of electricity. This piece here, you can see the copper. Uh, I don't know if I'll move this a little bit, if, I, if you can see it, catch it in, in the camera but it glimmers and gleams, and it has that copper penny look. This one here also has copper in it, and you can actually see that the green verdigris is marking it. And then there's a little bit of the galena, which I mentioned was an associated mineral. If you look, you can see that this is pretty well the same kind of stone as what I've got in my hand. And uh, that's how the copper was deposited. So it's really interesting how a person can... Uh, oh, and here's a native copper from Canada. This has been smelted. This one is actually in, in form. You can get them so they're very wiry. Uh, this came uh, from our, our area up by the Craigmont Mines, both of these pieces. So why I'm discussing this is that I feel that oftentimes stamp collecting can lead one into diverging into other areas. And uh, I got into rock collecting through my father when I was about six or seven years old. And he began us first before we got into rocks with stamps. Um, because we were living in Mexico at that time, and it wasn't really safe to take children out in the desert. So once we got back to Canada when I was nine, we continued with the stamps, but he uh, began to diverge our collecting interests into rocks. And we did a lot of hiking as a child, and some of the rocks I've shown you actually came from that time. However, uh, I continue to do this, and I'm well into my 60s uh, whenever I can. And this, the nexus of my uh, rock collecting was the stamps, because you could see some stamps did show rocks. Now, my, my collection is not very big, I have to say. But I had a bigger collection when I was younger. Actually, my dad had it. So a lot of these rocks I've been sharing with you were in his. So that's it for today. Until next time, keep on looking into and for stamps. And if you get a chance, go outside your home and... See what kind of rocks you can find in nearby rivers or streams as long, as long as the water isn't running too fast. You must do that safely and go with somebody. Uh, we always did. We were always three or four and we waited till high water was over. Stamp Sleuth, signing off.